Welcome to another lecture in the course Literature and Identity in the Middle East. I'm Dr. Nikolsky and I'm the teacher and coordinator of this course. <laughs> Today I will talk about two options of leadership in the Palestinian society. One which is staying inside the country and trying to change from within, and the other is trying to change from the outside. For the Palestinians, this question, this choice is very relevant because of their special circumstances as people for whom self-ruling and geographical sovereignty is unstable to put it mildly. Following the war that followed the UN resolution to allocate two states to both the Arabs and Jews in the area, a war which ended up in the state of Israel, including all these areas, marked here the areas of Israel in both blue the origin, what was originally allocated uh, for the state of the Jews, and in pink, what was originally allocated for an Arab, for the Arab state, but now is under the rule of the state of Israel. I'm talking about 1948 and around that. What happened to the Palestinian population in the areas under Israeli rule is one of the following. The population was killed, it was expelled, it was exiled to another place of um, another place of living, a near, nearby village or a city, with or without consent. The population escaped, they escaped or then returned, or they stayed put. Now, all these options uh, happened. What happened to the Palestinian settlements, the Palestinian uh, area uh, places is one of the following things. They were destroyed. They were not destroyed but repopulated by a uh, Jewish population or the, they stayed, you know, stayed as is or being partially repopulated. This happened mainly in the cities. Originally Arab neighborhoods could be partially repopulated by uh, with Jewish population. For example, a house in a neighborhood of, uh, where, where the owner fled was being repopulated by a, a, a Jewish family. This was less sensible, of course, partially populating, repopulating in the Palestinian villages, but this is something that happened in the cities. Here are some examples. Well, we cannot see the destroyed places, of course, especially if uh, something else was built on top of it in the same place. But see, for example, here, uh, the village uh, Lifta at the outskirts of Jerusalem, which lost its population. The houses stayed put here, but uh, time has its impact and th they are uh, decaying. As you can see, this is a completely lifeless uh, area. On the other hand, look at this uh, film about the village Abu Ghosh also close to Jerusalem, a thriving big, big village, a local council uh, now. And you can also find anything in, in between these two extreme options.
I will talk today about two Palestinian leaders, each representing a different direction taken by Palestinian leadership. The first is the author Emil Habibi. You see him here on the right. And the second, somewhat younger uh, generation, is Mahmoud Darwish. Uh, Emil Habibi. Emil Habibi was born in Haifa to a Protestant family in 1922. He died in 1996. Haifa at the time was a thriving city, economically speaking, under the British mandate when uh, Habibi was born, with a strong middle class and uh, intelligentsia. Yeah, an uh, intellectual elite, and much interaction with the Jewish population. Habibi was introduced to, the, uh, to communism as a child by his brother. He became active in the Communist Party. In 1948, he escaped to Jordan, or to the West Bank, and from there to Lebanon. Uh, because he had unpopular opinions, he was uh, threatened and he had to flee. Uh, within uh, the Palestinian society. He returned three months later to Haifa illegally and uh, later moves, moved to Nazareth. He joined the Israeli Communist Party, Maki, and was a, a Knesset member from this uh, party between 1953 and 1965, so 12 years. Then he joined the pro-Soviet uh, um, Communist Party that developed then, the Rakach. Habibi was the editor of Al Ittihad, the journal of the Communist Party from 72 to uh, 1989. Habibi wrote uh, short stories in the 50s, but after he left his political work, he wrote a few novels. So he started his uh, career as, as an author later on in life. His uh, most famous book is The Pess Optimist, or The Secret Life of Said. Another book is Ikhtiyat. Another one is Saraya, the ogre's daughter. And he won some literary prizes. Sumud. The word Sumud means perseverance, resilience, with a basic me meaning of immovability, staying put, hanging on, being stuck to where one is. This was the ideological line which was persistent in Habibi's life and uh, work. The way he used it was not so much in a form of uh, resistance, which uh, is the meaning that the word took later on, or uh, militant activity or activity at all. It was the idea of staying, of continuing the life, regardless of the situation uh, the new situations or changes, you know, just continuing the life as it was. The idea behind it is to, to understand the Palestinian strength in their mere existence in the land and in their continuation of their way of life, regardless of what the regime is and what passing ideologies are. The area has seen so many regimes, so many empires come and go, that the feeling is that as long as we can persevere, this too shall pass. The ideology of Sumud continues since Habib, Habibi's uh, earlier uh, pre-state way of thinking, and this uh, this was not a very popular ideology at the time, and the, the uh, yeah not uh, insisting on um, resistance for the British mandate, for example. It is also the basis for Habibi's political activity within the State of Israel, joining the Jewish Com uh, Communist Party, participating in the Israeli political uh, life. Sumud was also Habibi's way of combining the universal, yeah, the communist point of view, with the local, the Arab identity as a culture, the geography, the language, the memory. He therefore constantly support, supported compromises to some extent and avoided extreme nationalism and he paid the price for this. His literary work regularly portrays an image of an Arab who finds him or herself in absurd uh, situations because of Sumud and because of the changing world around it. 
but because of the insistence to stay, the situation becomes absurd. Let us look now at uh, one of Habibi's books, The Pess Optimist. The novel The Secret Life of Saeed, The Pess Optimist, was written in 1974 after Habibi left political life. It was his first novel. The time period in the book is between uh, 1948 the war and the Six Days War in 1967. The protagonist is a Palestinian, Saeed, who is a pessimist, and there are quite a few parallels between the life and, uh, of this protagonist and Habibi's life. Saeed also left to Lebanon in 48, and then he sneaked back, just like uh, Habibi. The events in the book are written in a form of a few letters, which uh, Said sends to an unknown friend, probably someone from outer space, a place to which Said is kidnapped at the end of the novel, or perhaps it's a psychiatric hospital. The story tells about the adventures of Said as an informer to the Israeli government until this point that he was hospitalized. It is divided into three parts, named after three women in the life of Said, Yuad, his childhood love uh, and his first wife, Bakhia, his second wife, and uh, the second Yuad, uh, who is in fact the daughter of the first Yuad. Uh, all of which, all these women, the relationship with them didn't go well because of uh, basically Said's uh, uh, choices and character. So Said becomes an informer and Jakob, Jakub, Jakub, or Yaakov, is the middleman um, whom he, he talks to. I will not go into the details of the plot. I will only say that the plot blurs the borders between times and spaces and between fantasy and reality and between um, what, re what is really happening and how Said is reporting it. Said constantly is uh, Said is constantly failing and uh, in managing his life, or perhaps not. Yeah, perhaps uh, that's uh, perhaps he actually manages manages it quite well, uh, but always in an unexpected manner. It is also written in a very comic tone. We don't know whether the protagonist is very wise or very stupid. Is he cunning or is he just out of his mind? Said comes from a long line, for, long line of pessimists, optimists. And in the first uh, part of the, uh, of the book, it is explained what does it mean to be an, a piss optimist. We learn this when Said describes, uh, when Said is telling how his brother died. One day a storm blew up and overturned the crane he was operating, the brother, throwing them both onto the rocks and down into the sea. This is what uh, we hear. They, col uh, col they collected his remains and brought them to us. Neither his head nor his insides could be found. On page 13. After narrating this terrible loss, uh, we hear the uh, characteristic, uh, typical words of wisdom of the pessoptimist, uh, pessoptimist, uh, uh, wherever they are. The one-liner which is saying, it is best it happened like this and not in some other way. Yeah, so this is the one-liner of the pessoptimist. So pessoptimist is the combination between pessimist and optimist and it entails looking at bad events with the idea that things could have been even worse. Said comes, uh, as I said, from a family of uh, pessimists, and while this mindset can be difficult for anyone else, in the family this was completely understandable. When we have a flashback to the death of Said's uh, brother, as we just saw by accident, the mother mentions that the brother's death could have been worse, and the whole family understands this conclusion completely, except for the young bride, the, the young wife of the brother, who became very angry. 
the inability of the bride to understand the, the situation is an uh, epistemic modality. Yeah, is an epistemic modality that shows that the family possesses some information about the world that the other people lack. When the bride is presented as one who is lacking this information, we, the, the readers, begin to distrust the teller as this conclusion yeah, of the bride lacking information, which is the bride lacking information, seems to be diverting from common sense. While the teller is presenting the pessimistic option as the commonsensical one, at least within the family. So this discrepancy results in our doubting the reliability of the teller. The teller thinks in an abnormal, the teller thinks of abnormal situations as normal, and he even praises uh, this way of thinking. But this, of course, results in the em uh, emotional understanding of the Palestinian situation, having to look at bad things in relation to possibly worse ones, instead of acknowledging the, the bad situation. The need of the Palestinians, at least those who live within the state of Israel and are Israeli citizens, to comply with something they see as not so good uh, is what makes this uh, emotional tension in their life. Now for the second text. Eventually, Said is put in prison because he raises a white flag in Haifa during the 67 war. Contrary to cities in the West Bank, Haifa was not con considered a, a city occupied by Israel, certainly not in the 67 war, if, if at all, then the 48. And raising, raising the flag came across as Said's uh, believing Haifa was in fact under occupation when uh, this was uh, taken to be uh, a tre treason, yeah, so uh, and criticizing of the state. It all came about on one of these devil-ridden nights of the June War. I was tuned in, to be on the safe side, to the Arab language broadcast of Radio Israel. I heard the announcer calling upon the defeated Arabs to raise white flags on the roofs of their homes so that the Israeli servicemen, flashing about air quick all over the place, would leave them alone, sleeping safe and sound inside. This order somewhat confused me, to which defeated Arabs was the announcer referring? Those defeated in this war are those defeated by the Treaty of Rhodes? I thought it would be safe to regard myself as one of those defeated and convinced myself that if I was making a mistake, they would interpret it as an innocent one. So I made a white flag from a sheet, attached it to a broomstick, and raised above the roof of my house in Jabal Street in Haifa, an extravagant symbol of my loyalty to the state. But who, one might ask, was I trying to impress? As soon as my flag was flying for all to see, my master Jacob honored me by bursting in on me, without so much as a how are you. So I did not greet him either. He yelled, lower it, you mule. I lowered my head until it touched his very feet and asked, did they appoint you king of the West Bank, your majesty? Jacob seized me by the lapels of my pajamas and began pushing me up the stairs towards the roof, repeating, the sheet, the sheet, he began to weep, saying, you're finished, old friend of a lifetime. You're finished and so am I along with you. I tried to explain, but I raised the sheet on the broomstick in response to the Radio Israel announcer. As, as, he responded. Here again, the reader is left uh, dumped or shocked by the protagonist's uh, actions. How could he be thinking of himself as a defeated Arab? Nothing has changed in his status. He lives in Haifa, which was part of his, uh, the Israeli state already for years. All the world switches the protagonist makes are completely absurd. Is it safe to regard myself as a defeated Arab with a, with a positive answer to this question? Uh, this is presenting an epistemic uh, world switch, which the protagonist is completely sure about, but we know that uh, uh, this is not going to work. When the middleman, Jacob, uh, asks him uh, to lower it, the protagonist lowers his head, again creating a completely different reality, yeah. a completely different uh, world switch uh, than what we and, and Yaakov understand. 
we, we recognize that what he should have done was to lower the flag, not to lower his head. So his, the protagonist reaction is creating in us a, a complete mistrust with his uh, maybe intelligence or sanity. But again, given the circumstances, it is not he who is absurd, it is the situation which does not allow him to manage his life, no matter how much he's uh, ready to cooperate and to make compromises. Habibi died at the age of 74 in 1996. On his grave, he asked to be inscribed, I stayed in Haifa. Baqa fil Haifa fitting to his life and his ideology. He's a photo of his grave and you cannot see whether this is written on it or not. Uh, we cannot see it from this photo. After his death, a square in Haifa was named after him, as you can see here in the picture, and as well as a street in Jaffa and a street in Ramla were named after him. I move now to Mahmoud Darwish. This is Mahmoud Darwish, born in 1941 and died in 2008. Darwish was born in a village called Albirwe, just east of Acre. During the 48th war, the, pe the people fled the war and Darwish's family fled to Lebanon. But they returned to the village a year later and lived there for a short period and until the population uh, were, was expelled to nearby villages such as Tamra, uh, Jdeide or uh, Kafr Yassif. And the village Albirwe was mostly destroyed except for a few buildings, one of which you can see here. This was the school of the, of the village. And the Kibbutz Yasur was built on the place as well as uh, uh, an agricultural town called Ahihud. The inhabitants, including the Darwish, were therefore what is called internally displaced. Darwish attended, attended a high school in Kafr Yassif and was a member of the communist youth organization. He later moved to Haifa. He worked as a journalist and the second editor to various uh, magazines of various socialist and communist parties and published his first poem, his first poem book, when he was 19. His poems are full of pain and anger at his and his people's humiliation. His poems are very popular among uh, Arabs in Israel and the Israeli regime saw in him an agitator and, and a political activist, a dangerous political activist, arrested him a few times and put restrictions uh, on his uh, movability. In 1969, he left for Paris and then he studied in Moscow. In 71, he moved to Egypt and joined the PLO, which at the time was considered an illegal terrorist organization. And was, active, uh, and was active within this frame. In 1995, he came back to Israel for Emil Habibi's funeral and was allowed to stay there for a few days, then allowed to live in Ramallah in the West Bank. In 2007, he returned to Haifa to recite his poems in an event in his honor, but overall he stayed in uh, Ramallah. He lived in Ramallah. He died from a heart condition after an operation in Texas, USA, and was buried in Ramallah, even though he asked to be buried uh, near his birthplace. There is a museum next to his grave, uh, which keeps his writings and uh, which documents his writing and his political activity. He published more than 30 poem books, was famous worldwide, and was translated into many languages. He is considered the Palestinian national poet. He had a Jewish girlfriend in his youth and was married to a Palestinian woman later on for a few years, but most of his life was dedicated to poetry, which bore so much national pain that he could not keep it as private poetry and or universal human condition poetry but it so it became very national 
and it became representative of the Palestinian situation. The Israeli regime also looked at him as a representative of the Palestinians. When there was a, a lefty minister of education, he wanted to include his poems in the schools, in the school's curriculum. This was not accepted. And when there was a righty minister of communication or security in this case, he reproached the head of the radio station that allowed a series of lectures on the wishes poetry to be um, broadcasted. Here is a trailer of a film that was made about Darwish by the Palestinian director Ibtissam Marana. And uh, here we can see the, the colorful personality uh, that he had. אני חושב שכל מה שקורה בעולם הוא חולם שהקול שלו יהיה הקול של האחרים. דרוויש המשורר הפלסטיני המתגורר בגלות הגיע בסוף השבוע לשלושה ימי ביקור בישראל, ביקור ראשון אחרי שגלה מכאן לפני 26 שנה. הקרע שהיה בחיים האישיים שלי הוא חל על המורדת שלי. הילדות שלי נלקחה ממני בזמן שהבית שלי נלקח ממני, בזמן שהאדמה שלי נלקחה ממני. כתב על מי? כתב על קום של פלסטין, כתב על אלברווה, כתב על אלחתלל, כתב על שוהדה, ופי נפס לא כתב על אינסן. את עצמך התנסת באהבת נעורים בלתי אפשר, שלך ושל המשורר מחמוד דרוריס. השארתי את זה בסוד, את הקשר הזה איתו. זה היה על יום חמישי. זאת אומרת, אני אוהב אותך, הוא מרגיש אותך כל רגע. כל שיר אהבה שאני כותב אומרים שזה אדמה, שזה מולדת. ריטה זה שם שבחרתי. ותמיד ריטה בשירים שלי היא אישה יהודייה. זה סוד? יש משהו באהבה הבלתי אפשרית הזאת, היא מעבר למלחמות, ואולי לפעמים בגללן. תמרי, יש לי הרגשה שאני נפצע, נפצע קשה. הוא כאן ומכאן סררי, יחרו ג'ויט לטהר. אחרי זה הוא נעצר. מה הוא עשה? מה הקשר של אחד אינו יעני בדו אחר סוף דו טריק לבלד? אני לא רוצה לפתח את המתח בין זהות לבין אזרחות. ועומר אמר שתטוור אל קסידי אם תקום תטווירה יעני תחלי עני אל-וטן. זוואג' באלאוול סמר אשחור בס כאן עניף ומעסק. He was a wanted man. We never slept in the same place. לצערי או לא אשתמחתי כל פרסטין חושב שאני מייצג אותו. Things had broken down. It wasn't all uh, poetry. I was a man. Don't forget the idea of your mind, and I don't want to forget the idea of your mind. Are you still an Israeli? I was once, but I don't know. I don't have to accept it. I'm in trouble with myself. I'm an Arab. I'm an Arab. I'm an Arab. The name of the film, which we, or the trailer of which we just saw, is taken from the repeating line in a poem of Mahmoud Darwish, a poem called Identity Card. The poem Identity Card, at, uh, at which we will now uh, look shortly, is probably the most famous of Darwish's poems and was written in 1964. So let us first listen to it being recited. It is read in Arabic with English subtitles in a conference held in honor of Darwish's work in the Van Leer uh, Academic Institution in Jerusalem. <laughs> سجل أنا عربي ورقم بطاقتي خمسون ألف وأطفالي ثمانية وتاسعهم سيأتي بعد صيف فهل تغضب؟ سجل أنا عربي وأعمل في مع رفاق الكدح في محجر وأطفالي ثمانية أسل لهم رغيف الخبز والأثواب والدفتر من الصخر ولا أتوسل الصدقات من بابك ولا أصغر أمام بلاط أعتابك فهل تغضب؟ سجل 
سجل أنا عربي أنا اسم بلا لقب صبور في بلاد كل ما فيها يعيش بفورة الغضب جذوري جذوري قبل ميلاد الزمان رست وقبل تفتح الحقب وقبل السرو والزيتون وقبل ترعرع العشب أبي أبي من أسرة المحراث لا من سادة النجب وجدي كان فلاحا بلا حسب ولا نسب يعلمني شموخ الشمس قبل قراءة الكتب وبيتي كوخ ناطور من الأعواد والقصب فهل ترضيك منزلتي؟ أنا اسم بلا لقب سجل أنا عربي ولون الشعر فحمي ولون العين بني وميزاتي على رأسي عقال فوق كوفية وكفي صلبة كالصخر تخمش من يلامسها وعنواني أنا من قرية عزلاء منسية شوارعها بلا أسماء وكل رجالها في الحقل والمحجر فهل تغضب؟ سجل أنا عربي سلبت كروم أجدادي وأرضا كنت أفلحها أنا وجميع أولادي ولا ت... ولم تترك لنا ولكل أحفادي سوى هذه الصخورة فهل ستأخذها حكومتكم كما قيل؟ إذا سجل برأس الصفحة الأولى أنا لا أكره الناس ولا أسطو على أحد ولكني إذا ما جعت آكل لحم مغتصبي حذاري حذار من جوعي ومن غضبي تدعى. The situation depicted in the poem is of a Palestinian person being demanded to show his ID card apparently when trying to move from the West Bank or sometimes is Jerusalem into the area of the Green Line as movability between these areas is not free for Palestinians. This is what it looks like today, but in fact, it was published in 1964, before there was a West Bank, I mean, in the sense of occupied West Bank and occupied East Jerusalem. So it is probably referring to the request to show ID cards to the representative of the martial law under which Palestinian villages were put from 1948 until 1966, a very long time. We only have one side of the participants in a discourse, the Palestinian voice, who, contrary to the situation in a discourse world, and in spite of it, is very assertive. Using the imperative, write down, yeah, this shows assertivity. The poem is reversing elements that are usually used to put Arabs down, such as having many children, working in manual labor, quarry in the poem, darkish look, etc. In many of these, the teller is creating a word switch by expanding the answer from the mere bureaucratic information needed in such circumstances to a larger, uh, richer reality of Palestinian life, yeah, creating a, a, a reality of this. The teller presents these realities, these word switches assertively and as I was saying, creating the reverse attitude than what was expected, not the negative, the ontic, but a positive one. I'm an Arab and I want to be an Arab. I'm happy to be one. The teller asks the interrogator, are you angry? An interrogator who is absent in the dialogue. This question thus turns out to be Bulomaic world of the teller, since there is no. Uh, other person there. He wants, the he wants the interrogator to be angry, but the interrogator is not there, not even to be angry. The teller ends up assigning the anger to himself, who is also an, an actor in the poem. Yeah, so he's not just a teller. 
that usually, so he's a participant, uh, he's a participant teller, but usually for the listener of the poem, the interrogator does exist in, in spite of it, uh, the absence in the actual poem. And the anger does have a tar target, which is the interrogators so that in the mind of the reader of the poem is there, but in the poem itself is not there. This poem became much identified with Darwish, Darwish and one of the best known Palestinian poems ever. It is almost an anthem of Palestinians from Palestine and is sung on occasions of their visiting their destroyed or stolen villages, um, which, they, um, which they do sometimes. Darwish himself actually did not like this poem. He did not include it in his later collections and there's no record of him reciting it. Darwish was known to say that he did not want to be the representative of anything. He wanted to be a poet engaged with universal issues, but he found himself again and again being a symbol, being the voice of the Palestinians to a large extent in the international arena, similarly to people like Edward Said. Darwish and Said knew each other. Edward Said, who was born in uh, 1935, was Darwish senior and he was a, a well-known uh, person at the time that uh, Darwish was active. After the death of Said, Darwish uh, wrote a poem in his memory telling about their walking together in New York. Let's hear a few minutes of Darwish's reading, Darwish himself reading this poem. New York, November, الشارع الخامس. الشمس صحن من المعدن المتطاير. قلت لنفس الغريبة في الظل: هل هذه بابل أم سدوم؟ هناك على باب هاوية, هاوية كهربائية بعلو السماء التقيت بإدوارد قبل ثلاثين عاما. The part which is, which is interesting for us is of course about the identity and here it is. What about identity? I asked. He said, it's self-defense. Identity is the child of birth, but at the end, it's self-invention and not an inheritance of the past. I am multiple. Within me a never new exterior. And I belong to the question of the victim. Were I not? From there, I would have trained my heart to nurture their dear of metaphor. So carry your homeland wherever you go, and be a narcissist if need be slash. The outside world is exile. Exile is the world inside. And what are you between the two? Without going too deep into the analysis, we see here Said's opinion about identity, according to the wish, uh, the wishes poem, as opposed to the motivation that poems give to people regarding their identity. And in the case of Said, his ideological and theoretical writing, Said's identity, as the poem tells, is uh, difficult to catch. It is very gentle and it is delicate. It is complex, nuanced, and non-aggressive. Identity is a choice. It is something someone is born with, but they must later on make a choice uh, about it. It is deontic. He feels obliged to join the, the victim. He cannot afford to let go of his identity. Therefore, Said's advice to Darwish, carry the homeland wherever you go. Exile is inside, and outside. Create yourself, your own self, to be equal to the social self. Yeah, so uh, blurring the border between the private and the, and the public personality of a national poet, when you are a national poet. This, as I see, describes the role of the poet or the philosopher, according to Said and Darwish. Uh, it is uh, itself a social role that is total. It is taking over all the personality, yeah? all the self of the, the person. 
Darwish asked to be buried in the vicinity of his home village, as I said. However, being such a representative personality and residing a, lo a large part of his life uh, outside the state of Israel, the Palestinian leaders of the time decided that he should be buried in uh, Ramallah in West Bank, a place which is easily accessible to most Palestinians as opposed to uh, um, Al Birwe or its uh, uh, surrounding. So Dar Darwish was a poet. This was his main tool for organizing his life. Everything else that he did or achieved was built on his poetic uh, perso persona. He chose to be a diaspora Palestinian, even though in the end he lived in Ramallah, you might say in Palestine, but he still was an internal exile, as, uh, as I said earlier. His village was destroyed and uh, being an internal exile was the experience that led his wife, his life, his identity, his poetry, and thus his career. His political activity, which was not uh, hands-on politics, but more behind the scene and on the intellectual side. Um, for example, he formulated the Palestinian Declaration of Independence in 1988, yeah, on, on, on top of the document that existed before that. In his poetry, he tackled Palestinian issues head on, not going roundabout, not being um, humoristic about it, not being the absurd literature about it, uh, and not uh, posing any solution uh, in, his, uh, in his reality. There is no solution in, in his poems. He saw his role in the expression of the hardship. From the examples of Habibi and Darwish, we saw two choices made by Palestinian leaders when facing the impact of the social model of the nation state. This model arose when the population in the area were conquered by Western forces, thus dispensing the Ottoman rule, which was there for centuries. The European Jews played their card right by joining the nation state discourse. They were, after all, Euro uh, of European culture to, to, to some extent, to a large extent. But as their position in the European system was not strong, they claimed their own national state and eventually got it. For the Palestinians, the issue of the nation state was not so self-evident. After all, they did not have to comply with Russian social system. And I'm talking about the, the, uh, the, the bureaucratic system, not uh, culturally, there were always uh, um, um, connections. But they didn't have to take on the, the, the Western social system for centuries. Napoleon, for example, did not manage to take over the area. The, the national identity, therefore, of the Palestinians as a nation developed later, and the struggle for the nation state is still going on. So Habibi chose the Sumu to stay, to comply with whatever regime exists at the moment and to support the people from the inside. Darwish chose the opposite, the diaspora, working for, uh, for the people from the outside, joined the international forces, mostly diasporic cultural ones, but also political ones, the, the sublegal, um, if necessary, uh, status of the PLO at the time, which eventually changed. What we see here very typically is the importance of literature in Palestinian culture, in Palestinian identity, and in Palestinian social system. This is, this in fact is true for Arab culture in general. The state of, of, of the status of literature, of prose, poetry, of the poet, of the author is different. It's much uh, higher and much more important um, than the modern European, modern European societies. It's not only a locus of entertainment, it is not all, only uh, a lower class type of or middle class type of, um, of uh, leadership. It is in fact the thing that the highest political uh, personalities take pride in. Yeah, it's not sports, it's not war, it's literature. So this in itself is an interesting point. So thank you very much. This is the end of this uh, lecture and here comes your assignment.
it. Below this lecture, you can find a link to a trailer of a film by Ibtisam Marana. Please watch this clip and answer the, the questions. To what does the word steps in the title of the movie refer? And the second uh, complex question is the following. What does the movie depict as the difficulties in Palestinian life in Israel? Are these systemic difficulties or not? How do you conceptualize these difficulties? Submit your answer of 200 words in the assignment link found below this lecture and the deadline uh, is also found there. Thank you for listening and I will see you in the seminar.